Hi, baking friends, it's Melanie again in the King Arthur studio, and today we are making tiger milk bread from our big book of bread. You can also find the recipe in the link in the description. We're gonna start our dough by working with our tangzhong mixture. First, I'm gonna put 14 grams of bread flour into my pot, along with 43 grams of milk and 43 grams of water. I'm gonna whisk this together until you don't see any more lumps, and then we'll actually turn on our heat. We're starting with this tangzhong mixture because it's going to keep our bread nice and moist. It'll keep it fresher longer. And the way it does that, as we are mixing this flour and water and milk mixture together and start heating it up, the starch granules in that flour are going to start swelling and absorbing that water. So they're really binding the water. What that means in our final bread is as it starts to age, instead of losing that moisture, this Tangzhong method will help our bread keep the moisture and stay fresher longer. So our mixture is starting to thicken now. Those starch granules are swelling, and we're gonna continue whisking this until we get that paste-like gel. It should be thick enough that you can see the revolutions you're making in the pot. Once this mixture is ready, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer it right into my mixing bowl. So we have our nice hot tangzhong mixture in our bowl, and to that we're going to add 300 grams of bread flour, 50 grams of granulated sugar, 14 grams of non-fat dry milk, nine grams of yeast, and six grams of salt. So those were all of our dry ingredients. And now we're gonna add our liquid ingredients. We're using cold milk in this recipe. Because we have that warm tangzhong mixture on the bottom, we want to cool this mixture down a little bit so that when we add our eggs, that we don't have to worry about them curdling. The other thing that we wanna think about is because we're gonna be mixing this for a long time, we wanna make sure that the dough does not get overheated. And then the last thing that's gonna go in is 57 grams of melted butter. We want this bread to be nice and strong and have a nice high rise. So even though we're adding all these enriching ingredients, we have that higher protein bread flour that's going to help our dough come together. We're gonna to start mixing this on low speed first, just to get our ingredients mixed together. So we're gonna let this mix until most of the dry ingredients are moistened, and then I'll stop and scrape everything down before I continue to mix again. This time, instead of mixing at low speed, we're gonna increase our speed so that we can really develop the gluten in this recipe. So our dough has been mixing for 15 minutes. What you'll notice now is that it has pulled away from the sides of the bowl, and you can almost hear the dough slapping against the side of the mixer bowl. That lets me know that our dough is sufficiently mixed. So we're gonna turn this off. It's a lot of extensibility from that bread flour. Now that our dough is mixed, we're going to set it aside and start working on our cocoa mixture. We're gonna start by hydrating our cocoa. So to my pot, I'm going to add black cocoa and 43 grams of whole milk. I'm gonna turn on my heat just a little bit and start whisking this. We're gonna use the same procedure that we did with the Tangzhong method. The reason for that is that cocoa absorbs a lot of moisture. We wanna make sure that our cocoa is hydrated going into our dough so that once our loaf is baked, that cocoa isn't pulling moisture out of our bread and making it dry. We're using black cocoa to get that really deep contrast in our stripes, but if you only have a regular Dutch processed cocoa at home, totally fine, it'll just be lighter in color. And we're gonna keep going until this mixture is about the consistency of heavy cream. All right, we are just about there. And I'm gonna transfer this mixture to a separate bowl. We wanna make sure that this cools slightly before we add it to our dough. So what we're going to do next is just divide our dough into two pieces, one that's about 420 grams and one that's about 230 grams. That larger piece of dough is going to stay our plain dough. And for this, I'm just going to give it a little knead to smooth everything out. And we're going to put it smooth side up into our bowl. Because we don't want this to dry out, I wanna make sure that it's covered. There are lots of different ways that you can cover your 
dough to keep it from drying out. You just wanna make sure that air can't get in. So one thing that we mention in our big book of bread is that you don't wanna use just a towel. You want something that's going to keep the air out. So something like a bowl cover like this. You can even use a shower cap. They're nice and reusable. Or you can use plastic wrap. So this is just going to sit in a warm area for about an hour and a half until it's puffy, but not necessarily doubled in size. And the smaller piece, we're gonna add back to our mixer along with the hydrated cocoa. And we're gonna start mixing it at slow speed first. And then as the cocoa mixture starts to get mixed in, we'll increase the speed a little bit. We eventually want it to pull away from the sides of the bowl and look nice and smooth and shiny. Now we're going to add our chocolate chips. So I'm just gonna go ahead and mix this on low speed. If you find that after a few minutes your chocolate chips are not mixing in, you can actually work them in by hand, either in the bowl or out on a lightly floured countertop. All right, that looks good. We're now going to transfer that smaller amount of dough into a smaller bowl. It's going to rise for about an hour and a half you'll find that it becomes puffy, but again, won't necessarily double in size. To keep it from drying out, we're gonna put our little bowl cover on and it can rest right next to our other dough, again, for about an hour and a half. It's been about an hour and a half and our doughs are looking great. We can see that it's nice and puffy. Again, hasn't doubled in size, but still really nice and soft. And I'm gonna put a little bit of flour down on my surface and dump my dough out of my bowl. I'm gonna put a little bit of flour on top just so it doesn't stick to my fingers when I'm starting to stretch it out. Make sure it's not gonna stick underneath. So I'm just gonna press the dough to start releasing all of that carbon dioxide that built up as our dough is fermenting. I'm also gonna tug on the edges just a little bit to square them off. We want to eventually make an eight by 10 inch rectangle so by pulling on those edges, we can start to square it up instead of it being round. If you find that your dough is resisting you a little bit, you can always cover it and let it sit for a few minutes. That's the gluten letting you know as you stretch it, it wants to shrink back. And so it really just needs some time to relax. If you don't have time in your schedule, instead of just pressing it out, you can switch over to a rolling pin and then just roll it out gently. But I think we're pretty close. I'm gonna grab my ruler here. I'm a little bit shy of eight and I'm exactly at 10. So I'm just gonna roll it a little bit wider to hit that eight inches and then move it just a little bit off to the side so I can start working on my chocolate dough. Because the chocolate portion is a little bit sticky, I'm going to add a little more flour on top and maybe even a little bit more on the bottom just to make sure it's not gonna stick on me. So same thing, we're going to press out all of that carbon dioxide that's been built up during the fermentation process. And we're going to work this, even though it's a smaller amount of dough, into the same eight by 10 inch rectangle. So it will be thinner than your plain dough. All right, looks like we're just about there. I'm just gonna verify my measurements. Again, wanting it to be eight by 10, just like our plain dough. Because this is a little bit thinner than our plain dough, to make it a little easier to transport over here, I'm gonna sprinkle just a little bit of flour on top. I'm gonna to fold it in half, and then just gently work my fingers underneath it to move it over to my plain dough. Then I can easily unfold it. And what we're looking for here is to completely cover the edges of the white dough with the chocolate dough. And if you have little areas where you have little tears there where the chocolate chips were, you can just pinch them together. And I'm just going to square up my shapes a little bit by tugging on those corners. And now we're ready to actually roll this up. So I'm gonna start at the bottom on the short side closest to me and just start rolling very gently. Once I get started, I'm gonna start using both hands to kind of pull as I'm rolling up. As I get towards the far side away from me, I am again going to just tug on those corners a little bit to make sure that we stay even as we're rolling this up. Once I get that last revolution, I'm gonna turn it seam side up 
and pinch that seam together. We wanna make sure that it stays together and doesn't open up. And now I'm going to turn it so that the dough is directly in front of me and that seam is facing up. I'm gonna be using a sharp bench knife or you can use a regular knife. And right along that seam, I'm going to cut this completely in half. And this technique, if you've ever made babka, is very similar. So I'm gonna turn these cut side up so you can see that we have the chocolate dough and the plain dough. And then we're gonna make an X with these. I like to put kind of the prettier one on top. And then once we have our X, I'm just going to twist the top and the bottom. Once you get to the end, you're going to pinch the ends together and just tuck them under gently. And then I'm gonna do the same thing at the top. So just twisting those two pieces around each other. And I'm gonna gently just get my fingers underneath my dough and then set it right into my pan. And if you need to adjust anything, I'm gonna make this swirl a little bit tighter so that we can see that swirl on top. You can adjust it now. The great thing about this Pullman pan is that it has a lid. So when this loaf is baked, it's gonna be completely square all the way around. We're gonna set this in a warm area for about 40 to 50 minutes. What we're looking for is the dough to start to rise and about fill our pan about three quarters of the way. So our dough has been proofing for about 45 minutes. I'm gonna pull this back so that we can take a look. If I press it just lightly with my finger, you can see it just slowly fills that indentation. So that lets me know that my bread is ready to bake. Now we're gonna put this in our preheated 425 degree oven for 20 minutes. Once it's been baking for about 20 minutes, we're gonna reduce the heat to 350 and let it bake for an additional 25 minutes. Because it's been baking in the lidded Pullman pan, there hasn't been a lot of moisture that's been able to escape. So we wanna make sure that we take off the lid. We're gonna invert it onto our parchment lined sheet pan here and then put it back in the oven for five minutes at 350 to drive off some of that moisture. After five minutes, we're going to turn the oven off, prop the door open and let the bread cool in the oven while the oven cools down. With all those enriching ingredients like the egg and butter and sugar, the bread is really nice and moist. And I can't wait to take a bite of this. Mm. If you're wanting to make this recipe and you find that you don't have a half Pullman pan, you can always bake it in a regular eight and a half by four and a half loaf pan. Although it won't be completely straight on the sides, it has this beautiful shiny babka look on the top. I'm really excited that this tiger milk bread is in our new Big Book of Bread. And once again, I'm Melanie from the King Arthur Baking Studios and that's a wrap.